And in short, that fuel is prayer. So some people could say, what, what is this a message on? Is this a message on prayer or is this a message on evangelism? And the answer to that would be yes. It's a message on both of those because you can't really separate them. They go together. The fuel of evangelism is prayer. There is an intimate connection between prayer and evangelism. So I'm excited to take some time today to share some thoughts from Colossians chapter 4. This passage speaks to us about what I think are the two most critical things we should do as a church. But I think it also speaks to us about the two most neglected things in the church, those things being prayer and witnessing. So let's begin by reading our passage. You can see it up there on the screen and uh, that we might honor the reading of God's word. I would ask you to stand this morning. I just have a short passage to read verses two through four of Colossians chapter four. This is the word of God. The apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae and he says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open the door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should. And thank you. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. You know, it's been said that we can do more than pray after we've prayed but we can do no more than pray until we've prayed. Let me say that again in case you didn't pick that up. We can do more than pray after we've prayed, but we can do no more than pray until we've prayed. That was a quote from a man by the name of Samuel Dickey Gordon, who was a lay minister with the YMCA in the late 19th and early 20th century. So that was a quote that's been around for a long, long time. And again, in case you missed it, we can do more than pray after we've prayed but we can do no more than pray until we prayed. Like I've already said, I want to talk about both prayer and evangelism today because it's not an either or thing. It very much is a both and situation. As Gordon said, it begins with prayer. Prayer is where it all starts, but genuine gospel prayer should move us to mission. It should move us to evangelism. It should move us to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with other people after we've prayed. I think that's the truth that Paul is expressing in Colossians chapter 4. Like Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun, so Samuel Dickey Gordon didn't dream that up 100 and 120 years ago. He's just parroting Paul's pattern that he gives us here in Colossians chapter 4. Notice that Paul begins with prayer in verse 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. But he goes on and he says, stay alert. That's translated watch in many translations. If you have a, a different translation in your Bible there, you might see it translated as watch. The NIV says being watchful and thankful. The ESV says being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The King James says watch in the same with thanksgiving. Have you ever traced the theme of watching through the Bible. It's an interesting exercise. I, I would encourage you to do that. If you have time today, just sit down and spend 15, 20 minutes, get out a Bible concordance, get on your computer, find a search program, and just look up every verse that has to do with watching. You're going to find a variety of meanings at times that refers to a, a, a period of time when a sentinel observes to protect a guard's watch, if you will, standing watch in the military but it also means close observation and it's frequently a word that's used in the Bible to denote prayer like we see here it comes from the same root word as being awake so it means to forego sleep to pray means to forego sleep let me ask you a question when was the last time that you set your alarm an hour earlier so that you could get up and spend some extra time in prayer in the morning I don't want to answer that question because I don't like the answer because it's been a long, long time since I, I got up. I usually get up between 6 and 6.30. Uh, I'm not going to set my alarm at 5 and get up. But, you know, is Jesus even up at 5 o'clock? Well, he is, of course. I'm being silly. But, you know, sometimes because he is up 24-7, we need to set our alarm early and we need to get up and we need to spend some extra time in prayer. Prayer takes effort. Prayer is work. 
And sometimes we're not willing to put in that kind of work. But serious prayer is a time investment worth making. If we're going to reach people for Jesus, that's where it starts, church. It starts with praying. It starts with watching. We've got to stay alert. We've got to be willing to spend sweat equity in prayer. Why is it that churches so often seem to be accomplishing so little for the kingdom? I'm sure that there are a plethora of reasons as to why that happens, but you know, for some churches it's probably because there's sin in the camp. Some churches are harboring an Achan, or maybe plural, Achan's more than, than one Achan. Maybe you remember him, the Old Testament story of Joshua. You remember that account? We think about Joshua marching around the walls, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls come tumbling down. We sing that song with our children. And, and indeed, that's what happened. You know, the, uh, Joshua defeated Jericho and, and you know, was told to utterly destroy everything. But there was a man by the name of Achan who was part of the group that went in. And what did Achan do? Achan kept some of the spoil for himself. He did not follow God's instructions. He did not you know, utterly destroy everything. He held back some things and said, hey, these have some value. So I'm going to keep them for myself. And as a result, when the army went to the very next city, the city of Ai, this little podunk place, this little dinky, rinky-dink place that should have been easy for them to defeat, but instead, they were utterly defeated. Sin in the camp is always a tragedy. Whether it's the pastor or the parishioner, that sin needs to be confessed and it needs to be forsaken because failure to do so leads to ineffectiveness in our mission. And so that could be one reason that many churches are ineffective. They have sin in the camp, and they have people who are not willing to repent and have not forsaken their sin and are not following the Lord wholeheartedly. Another reason that some churches may be ineffective is that they're just in a hard field. Now that could be one of several extremes. It may be that there's great resistance to the gospel where they are. For example, First Baptist Church of Baghdad, Iraq, is probably not on the list of the fastest growing churches in the world. They're probably not baptizing dozens and hundreds of people a year. And, and lest I hear too many amens, let me say that that's not true of North Glen Church. That's not true of the Glen Burnie area. We're not, we're not in a place like Baghdad, Iraq. And, and, and for other people, it may be that they're in a gospel-saturated area. If, if 90% plus of the community is already believers, you're, you're not going to reach a whole lot of people. I remember, I think it was about two summers ago, my wife and I decided to go down to Smith Island. How many of you have been down to Smith Island in the Chesapeake? handful of you know what that is. It, it's an island in the Chesapeake Bay where people live there. There's a community that's there. You, have, you can only access it by boat. No road that goes there. So we caught a boat down at Point Lookout. We live in Southern Maryland, St. Mary's County. We uh, hopped on a boat, rode over to Smith Island. And we're walking around looking at the island. There are three Methodist churches on the island. And there's this great big tabernacle structure uh, where they gather together and they had just finished their revival. And so we started talking to one of the locals. This lady was out working in her flower bed. And so we started talking to her about lots of different things. And I asked her about the tabernacle. I said, it looks like it was just you. She said, yes, we just got finished with our annual revival. I said, oh, that's wonderful. I said, how many people you know, you know, came to that. She said about 250 people came to it. I'm like, wow, that's good. And I'm thinking to myself, people must have come from, you know, offshore. And, and uh, I said, well, how many people live in this community? And she said, about 250. Um, that's when I really think, yeah, people came, you know, there's no way everybody on this island came to that. People came from, you know, other places, from Cambridge and other places. And I said, you know, we got three Methodist churches here. And, you know, when, when people go to church on Sunday, uh, um, among all of them, about how many people go to church? She said, about 250. And it finally started to dawn on me, everybody on this island goes to church. Now, whether they're saved or not, you know, I'm not arguing that. I don't know. I only talked to that one lady. You know, but they have 250 people on the island. They have 250 people in church. You know, you're not going to grow that church group from 250 to 500, you know, because everybody there is already going to church. That may be one reason that churches aren't reaching people. But lest I hear amens with that, let me just say that all of Glen Burnie is not coming to North Glen, you know, or any of the other evangelical churches around here. There are still plenty of folks in this area in order to reach. I'm convinced, though, that one of the main reasons 
that churches are ineffective in their mission is prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. We simply aren't people of prayer. And we aren't churches that pray any more than the cursory, let's say the blessing and thank God for the food at this fellowship meal. Or let's thank God for this time to worship today. Or let's ask God's blessings as we, as we leave. And I'm just as guilty of that as anybody. When was the last time that we spent extended time in prayer? I read an article recently. It was entitled, The Problem of Prayerlessness. And in that article, the author, whose name was John Onwuchekwa, this is what he said. I want to read it to you. I don't like to read whenever I preach, but I want to read this paragraph because I cannot say it any better than the author said it. Listen to what John Onwuchekwa said in his article, The Problem of Prayerlessness. He said, and I quote him here, I have pastored two churches over the past decade, and I've been involved with networks, organizations, seminaries, collectives, and other groups of Christians. I've sat with visionary leaders who have churches filled with great systems. I've also sat with leaders who aren't visionaries and who have churches with poor systems. I've done ministry with gifted individuals, people with average gifts, and people with very little gifting or proficiency at all. I've partnered with attractional churches, missional churches, mega churches, medium churches, and meager churches. Throughout my experience, I've learned that these distinctions aren't the most important. They're peripheral and secondary. If I had to draw a line to create two categories of churches, it wouldn't follow these distinctions. I've learned to see churches as those that pray, and those that don't. A church's commitment to prayer is one of the greatest determiners of its effectiveness in ministry, end quote. I agree with that. A church's commitment to prayer is one of the greatest determiners of its effectiveness in ministry. I hope you too agree with that assessment. What about you? Do you pray? If the prayer life of North Glen Community Church was measured by your own personal prayer life, would this be a mighty church of prayer or would this be a meager church of prayerlessness? I think one of the greatest signs of this issue is our reticence to attend special prayer meetings. If you have a hundred people at a church, I'm not talking about North Glen in particular here, I'm just talking about churches in general. If you got a hundred people in the church and you announce a special potluck meal that you're going to have, a potluck fellowship meal, there'll be 75 or 80 people there and some of the best food you've ever eaten in your life. Amen. You have a hundred people in that same church and you say, we, we're burdened about this. We need to pray. We need to come together. We're going to have a two-hour prayer meeting. You'll be lucky if 10 people show up for that. We just don't pray. I think that says one of two things. Either we really don't believe in the power of prayer or it says we don't care and we don't want to see God move. But notice that Paul continues to speak about open doors for making known the mystery of Christ. You see, beyond praying, there is work to do. As Gordon said, we can do no more than pray until we pray, but after we've prayed, we can go. We can share the good news. We can join in our collective mission of taking the gospel to all people. So what I want to do over these next few minutes is I just want to examine the text devotionally. I want you to notice three things that I think we see from this text. First of all, I think there's a perilous procedure. There's a perilous procedure, and that is praying without going. Scripture always links praying and going together. It may seem spiritual to say, I'll, I'll stay back and I'll pray while others go. I, I'm, I'm the prayer warrior. I, I don't need to go and share. Other people can do that, but, but I'll provide the prayer support. But the reality is, that's not spirituality. That's disobedience is what that is. Because the scripture calls all of us to go. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I, that's not meant to degrade the place and the importance of prayer. That's why I spent the first 15 minutes of this message talking about prayer because it is that important. We do need prayer warriors, and I will admit there may indeed be legitimate reasons for praying without going. Let me illustrate that one way. 
It's been said that missionaries like William Carey are few and far between. They, they're, they're generational. William Carey is a man who changed the history of missions in the face of India 200 years ago. Almost everybody knows the name of William Carey. But few people know about William Carey's sister. So few people know about her the historians don't seem to know about her. I tried to find her name. I couldn't find her name anywhere, but I found accounts of William Carey's sister. She was paralyzed and she was bedridden for 50 years. That's a five with a zero after it. 50 years. Can you imagine having to stay in your bed for 50 years? How did she spend her time every day? Every day she propped herself up on one elbow and she wrote long letters of encouragement to her brother in India. She spent hour upon hour upon hour praying for his work in India, praying that God would bless it, praying that God would, would bring the people to faith in Jesus. William Carey's sister is probably one of the very few examples of praying without going, of legitimate praying without going. But you know what? Your presence here today shows that you're not like William Carey's sister. There's not a one of us here that can use that excuse and say, I'm the prayer warrior. I'll pray while others go. Pray, yes, we must. But we also have to go because to pray without going is a perilous procedure. But that leads us to the opposite end of the spectrum. Not only is there a perilous procedure, but there is a powerless procedure as well. And that is going without praying. Let me make a, a confession to you today. I've, I've been in ministry 38 years now. And here's what I've found to be true in my life. Paul, I'm sure you've found this as well. This is honest confessions from pastors today because I know Paul would say the same thing to you if he was preaching to you today. There are times in our walk, even as pastors, there are times in our walk when we are really strong and we are really walking with Jesus. And then there are other times, well, not so much. Not so much. It doesn't mean we don't believe. It doesn't mean, you know, we don't want to be stronger. We're just not walking with the Lord as close as we should. And sometimes, I'm just speaking for me here. I'm not going to speak for Paul on this one. But for me, sometimes when I'm at one of those weak areas or one of those low areas, I will go just because it's part of my job. It's, it's expected. You know, I'm the pastor. I'm supposed to go and visit. I'm supposed to go and you know, meet this person. I don't really want to do it if I'm being honest. I'm just just being honest with the church. I really don't want to do it, but I, I will go and I will do it because it's expected and because it's part of my job. Somebody asked me maybe to go visit a, a neighbor or to go see a family member who's lost that's in the hospital. You know, it's a great time. Maybe you'll get a chance to witness to them. And, 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 and I go and I do that. And, and maybe I even witness, but nothing happens. Why? Did I pray before I went? Pfft, are you kidding me? I didn't want to go in the first place. You know, I didn't pray and ask God to bless that. I didn't ask God to guide me and use me. I just went because I had to do it. It, it is a powerless procedure to go without praying. Now, I am not saying that if you pray and then go witness, somebody's all, always going to get saved. I wish it worked like that, but it doesn't. Salvation is still a sovereign work of God. He can, and he has, and he will, again, work in ways that sometimes just astonish us. But as we said, the scripture links praying and going together. It is utter folly to go without having prayed. Let, let, me, let me ask you some questions, some rhetorical questions here today. Uh, Alligator Alley. I, I lived in Florida for a number of years. I went across Alligator Alley multiple times. Anyone else ever been across Alligator Alley? Okay, a few of you been down there to southern Florida. It's a road straight across the Everglades. You know, there's nothing there but alligators and pythons. That's all you're going to find in the Everglades. You know, you don't stop your car and get out to take a picture. I, I wouldn't. I mean, you can if you, if you want to risk it, but I, I wouldn't do that. But you go across Alligator Alley. As you start down that road, there's a little gas station right there. They charge an insane, you think gas prices are crazy now, you should see them there at Alligator Alley. They charge an insane rate probably. And there's a big sign there that says, no gas next 80 miles. Would you start down that road with your gas tank on empty? I guarantee you wouldn't. That would be a powerless thing. You would run out of gas and you'd be stranded with those gators and those pythons. And you wouldn't be eating them for dinner, they'd be eating you for dinner. 
and it wouldn't be a good thing. It would be a powerless procedure to try to make it all the way across Alligator Alley with no gas in your tank. Or let me use another illustration. Do we have any hunters in here? I used to bow hunt, okay? Got a couple folks that, that like to hunt. I used to love when I lived in Pennsylvania, go get in the tree stand with my compound bow, wait for the deer to come by. Never was able to, to get one, never got close enough, but it was, it was a wonderful time of fellowship with the Lord. But can you imagine, you know, maybe for this past Christmas, somebody got you a rifle, brand new rifle, and you're gonna take it out and you're gonna hunt. And you go out and you get up in that tree stand and you have your rifle and you got your camo on and you're, you're ready, but you didn't bring any ammo with you. You don't have any ammunition for that gun. You gonna bring the big buck home? You gonna put that as antlers up above your fireplace? You gonna put any meat in that freezer? I don't think so. That would be a powerless thing to go hunting without any ammunition. It would be just utterly useless. But so many people try to go and witness without having prayed. And then they wonder why there's no success. It is an equally powerless procedure, but there is a better way. We've talked about a perilous procedure and a powerless procedure. So let's talk finally today about a proper procedure, and that is praying and then going. We've already spoken about this because this is the pattern that we see in our passage here in Colossians chapter 4. But allow me, if you will, just to reflect on it for just a few more minutes. Too often, I think all we do is, is we pray and then we hope that there are going to be some results as a result of our praying. We do need to pray, but then we need to act on those prayers. We need to go and do something after we have prayed. So let me suggest an exercise for you, North Glen Church. Look around. You see the empty seats that are here? There probably have been times in the life of this church when these seats were filled with other people. As a matter of fact, I bet most of you could probably name some folks that you know that used to sit in these seats. So here's my challenge to you. Spend today through Wednesday praying for that individual. Whoever it is, just ask God to show you one person from North Glen that's no longer coming to church that, that you wish were still coming to church. Pray for them Sunday through Wednesday. Thursday through Saturday, make a concerted effort to reach out to them. Call them on the phone. Send them a text. Send them an email. If you know that they are at the ball field on Saturday, make it a point to swing by there. Encounter them. Stop by their house. Take them a plate of cookies or whatever. If you know that they golf and you golf, call them up. Hey, what are you doing Saturday? Want to play some golf? Make an, a concerted effort to reach out to them. And in the midst of that, let them know, I miss you at church. I'd, I'd like to invite you to come back to church. Start there and do that for several weeks and see if if people don't start responding to it and then start doing that with neighbors and with co-workers and with friends who don't know Jesus pray for them for a period of time and then make a concerted effort to reach out to them and share the good news of Jesus with them pray we must but we must likewise go and engage in the mission that we're called to prayer is the fuel of evangelism but what good is fuel if we don't go what good is fuel if we don't go? Let me tell you a story, a really cool story in this regard. This happened, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. But I still remember it like, like it was yesterday. I was serving on staff at a church in North Carolina. I was leading an EE ministry, Evangelism Explosion Ministry. And at that time, we went out on Thursday visitation, Thursday evening. It was one of those times that I was saying, you know, where you could just go and knock on somebody's door. I was saying this earlier. You could go knock on somebody's door and they just invite you in, pour you a glass of sweet tea, give you some cookies and just have a wonderful visit. Can't so much do that anymore. Uh, but back then, you know, we would just go out on 30 Thursday nights and we would in, encounter people and, and we would visit them at, the, at their home and seek to share the gospel with them. Well, on Wednesday night, the night before, we were having prayer meeting at church and we had a man by the name of Bobby Welch who was there. I don't know if that name rings a bell for you, but he's a past president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, the church I was serving was right down the road from Southeastern Seminary, so he was there to speak in their chapel service, and he chose to come to our church for a Wednesday night prayer meeting, and so he was just sitting there. He wasn't speaking. He was just in the prayer meeting, and at the end of the service, our pastor called on him to close the service in prayer. Now, he knew we had an evangelism explosion program and that we were going out on visitation the next night and so he begins to pray and, and I remember it clearly how he prayed he said Lord 
bless the evangelism explosion teams as they go out tomorrow night because one of them is going to encounter a young girl whose father's not involved in her life. May she trust you. May she come to faith. And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, that's just pastor prayer. You know, you just pray in generalities and, you know, I, I didn't think a whole lot more about it. Well, the next night came and my team went out and we were privileged to see a, a girl trust Christ that night. We visited with her in her home and shared the gospel and she came to faith in Jesus. And we get back in the car to go back to the church and one of the guys is just over the moon excited. I mean, you know, anytime someone trusts Christ, that's an exciting thing. Amen. And so, you know, you always are excited about that. But, but this, this guy was, he was over the top excited. I'm like, turned around I'm like dude wh what's what's the deal he's like mark don't you remember i said don't I remember what don't you remember pastor welch's prayer and it began to dawn on me you see that night we had seen a, a young girl 16 years old come to faith in christ part of her testimony is she hated her dad and because she hated her dad she hated god because she pictured god her heavenly father like her earthly father and her earthly father wanted nothing to do with her. He was hardly home. And when he was home, he was mean and nasty to her. Told her she was stupid. She was never going to amount to anything. She had no relationship with her earthly father. So she, as a result, didn't want much of a relationship with her heavenly father. We were able to share the gospel with her and how that's not the God of the Bible. And how we were so sad that she was experiencing that. But she would come to know a heavenly father that would love her unconditionally. And so she gave her life to Jesus. She got baptized in our church. My wife had the opportunity to disciple her through the, her later teen years. And, and, you know, it was just a wonderful thing. And, and I, I, you know, when my visiting buddy said that, I said, don't you remember that prayer? It dawned on me. That's exactly what he had prayed for. How did he know that? I have no idea. You know, did God somehow lay that on his heart? Probably. You know, was he just praying in general? And, and, and God used it? You know, maybe, you know, and, and again, am I saying that if you pray and then you go and witness, somebody's going to get saved? I, I wished it worked that way. Sadly, it doesn't. There's still plenty of times when you pray diligently, genuinely, and you go and witness and nobody responds. But the fact is, had we not gone that Thursday night, Pastor Welsh's prayer would have been in vain. It would not have been answered. It takes both. It takes praying and going these two are intimately bound together let me close by telling you the story of george sweeting in the in his book the no guilt guide for for witnessing he tells the story of john courier who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison later he was transferred and paroled to to work on a farm in tennessee paroled really not the the right word because it was still he was still incarcerated but he had to live on that farm. He could go nowhere. He could do nothing but work on that farm. But in 1968, his sentence was terminated. And a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. But he never received that letter. Because the farmer that he worked for intentionally kept the news from him. Because, hey, this was cheap labor, right? This was somebody that was working for him that he wasn't having to pay. Life on that farm was hard and had no promise for the future. But for the next 10 years, 1968 to 1978, John Courier kept telling, kept doing what he was told to do. His work release sponsor and his parole officer basically conspired to keep him enslaved. That was 1968 to 78. Most of us were alive then. This was slavery in our lifetime. We think about slavery and we say, oh, that was civil war. That was way back when. That doesn't happen today. Yes, it does. There are still people today, even in our own country, who are enslaved right now, either in work slavery or sexual slavery and being sold in, in those, those kinds of ways. Even after the farmer who was the work release sponsor died, John was still unaware that he was freed but it was when a new state parole officer took over the position and began to look at all the cases that, that he learned about John Courier's plight that things changed. He didn't send him a letter. He went and he visited him, and he told him face to face that his sentence had been terminated, and he was a free man, and he could leave. And so in 1978, John Courier 
finally walked off of that farm and began to live life as the free man that he was. Now, I'll tell you that story in order to ask you this. Would it matter to you if somebody sent you an important message? The most important message that you're ever going to receive. And yet year after year after year, that urgent message was never delivered. That is exactly what we are doing when we fail to be on mission. We are failing to deliver the most important message ever, the message of the good news of Jesus, that there is freedom from the bondage of sin. There is eternal life in him. And yet when we keep it to ourselves and we don't share it with others, we are failing in our task. We must pray, but then we must go. That is the only proper procedure. Let's be united in prayer together so that we can be on mission for King Jesus. Would you bow your head and pray with me? God, we ask you today to, to help us to be people of prayer and people of mission. Help us to see this not as a either or, but as a both and. May we not leave here today the way that we all arrived. Send us forth, Lord, with, with a holy desire to pray and then to go. Burden our heart with somebody that needs to know Jesus. Burden our heart for a straying sheep who's lost his or her way. Remind us daily to hold them before you in prayer. And as Paul prayed, open the door for us to speak the mystery of Christ and make it known as we should. We ask this in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor.